different thing. Okay, we're going to get started. It's 8.03 and we already have 50 people signing up, so it's great. It's my great honor to introduce Professor Robert Bono. Dr. Bono is a Goldberg Distinguished Professor of Cardiology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He received his MD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and he serves as a senior investigator in the intramural cardiology branch at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute from 1976 to 1992. He was also the Chief of Division of Cardiology at Northwestern University from 1992 to 2011. He's authored or co-authored over 670 papers in PubMed and over 120 book chapters. He's actually the Editor-in-Chief of JAMA Cardiology. We were talking about this earlier. Now, last year with COVID, they had over 1,000 papers that were basically COVID-related. They had over a million downloads of the three top papers were all COVID related. And uh, JAMA right now has an impact factor of 12.8. So that's all thanks to Dr. Bono that dedicates another full-time job to this uh, position. He's also one of the five editors of Brownwell's Heart Disease. And he's the past president of the American Heart Association, master of the American College of Cardiology, master of American College of Physicians, and currently serves on the board of scientific counselors of the NHLBI. He's got many awards, including NIH Director's Award, the Distinguished uh, Leadership Award, Distinguished Achievement Award, Gold Heart Award, and the James B. Herrick Award of the American Heart Association. The Distinguished Fellowship Award, Distinguished Survey Award, and Distinguished Sciences Award of the American College of Cardiology, the Denelin Award of the European Society of Cardiology, and the John Phillips Memorial Award of the American College of Physicians. Also, an Adobe Chair was established in his name at Northwestern in 2012. So it's really a great honor to have uh, Bob join us today. Hopefully next year we can have you here live. Thanks, Bob. Well, thank you, Carlos, and it is a pleasure to uh, be with you. Uh, we've all learned how to do this virtually, and uh, uh, hopefully you know, we're together in spirit, even though I'm not there personally. Uh, it's a lovely part of the world. I'd love to come visit at some point again. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, let's hope this works. How am I doing? Did that work? Yes, that's perfect. Great. Working. Okay. All right. So uh, we tried to settle on a topic that would be of interest to uh, everyone. And uh, this is an interest of mine. I know many of you as well regarding all of the um, uh, new information regarding aortic stenosis, uh, pathophysiology diagnosis, and obviously uh, new treatment options. Uh, all of these come with some challenges as well. Um, I have no relationships to disclose, no, no relationships with industry uh, other than uh, what I do with JAMA and uh, the Brown Mold textbook. Um, and so uh, where do we begin? Here, here's a patient of mine, he's 84. He claims to be asymptomatic. Uh, he's got a very calcified valve. He's got left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, he's got a, a, a peak velocity of 4.6, a mean gradient of 52 and an aortic valve area of 0 0.7 square centimeters. So he fits all the criteria for severe aortic stenosis. So this one's easy from a diagnostic point of view. There's no doubt what this patient has. Uh, it, it, what's not easy is the fact that he's 84 years old and he claims to be asymptomatic. So like, just like all the patients you probably saw yesterday also. Uh, so what do we have? We have, we have guidelines. Um, the, the 2017 guidelines became outdated almost on day one because of all of the uh, new information from clinical trials. The uh, ACC AHA guidelines were uh, revised and published in December uh, online in uh, January, February in print. Um, and the uh, European guidelines are in the process of appearing momentarily as well. And so we're, we're actually trying to stay ahead of the curve in terms of the uh, guidelines uh, uh, recommendations, but will always be behind because of new advances. Uh, when I talk about guidelines, um, recommendations, it will be the new ACC AHA um, revised uh, edition that we'll be discussing when I get there. <clears throat> okay, well, you all know that in North America, um, there's essentially two varieties of aortic stenosis, and, and the rest of the world, we have to worry about rheumatic heart disease also. 
Um, but for us, it's primarily the bicuspid valve on the left or the uh, degenerative calcific uh, trilethal valve on the right. Uh, we think of the bicuspid valve as being a uh, condition of younger people. And of course it, it is when we have a 30 or 40 year old individual. But importantly, um, Bill Roberts uh, and others have pointed out that uh, it's not a disease only of young people. In Bill Roberts' series of all the patients going for aortic valve replacement for aortic stenosis at uh, Baylor in, um, in Dallas, uh, over 50% uh, of the men over the age of 60 uh, have bicuspid valves and over the age of 80, one third of the men have bicuspid valves. So this has clear implications in the current era. Of, uh, of TAVR um, as we're still trying to, uh, you know, grapple with our individual decisions and what data are available regarding um, a transcatheter approach to bicuspid valves in this elderly population. And sometimes, of course, the valve may be so calcified that uh, with our imaging techniques, it's very difficult to determine who has a trilethal or bicuspid valve. But the other issue, uh, of course, with the uh, bicuspid valve is the associated aortopathy something that uh, Dr. Spadak is so uh, uh, much an expert in. Um, I'll spend a few minutes on this because of our collaborative research going on between your institution and mine through the work of uh, Paul, uh, David Guzardi and others uh, working with our group. But you know, when I grew up, I was taught that the reason the aorta dilates with a bicuspid valve is a post uh, dilatation because of the jet. And then uh, in the era of genetics and, cellu and cellular biology, uh, molecular biology, uh, new information came along regarding the fact that this may be more of a cell-cell um, uh, uh, um, communication issue uh, with matrix abnormalities. And so lots of data came along in the um, 80s and 90s, uh, early 2000s regarding the uh, uh, molecular abnormalities in the aortic wall associated with the genetics of bicuspid valves. So we have uh, uh, degeneration of the extracellular matrix, uh, increased expression of metalloproteinases, decreased expression of the tissue inhibitors of metalloproteinases, uh, smooth muscle cell apoptosis, and importantly, uh, excess TGF beta signaling, which is what happens uh, in patients with Marfan syndrome. Um, so the, you know, the suggestion might be some potentially druggable targets here. And so it shifted from being a uh, thought of a mechanical effect and being more of a, um, a cellular uh, molecular biology uh, issue um, and genetics. And it turns out it's probably a combination thereof because of the uh, really unique imaging characteristics we can do with MRI, working with uh, our radiology colleagues here, Michael Markle and colleagues. Uh, allowing us to look at 4D uh, images like this, where we have three-dimensional uh, imaging as well as the uh, temporal uh, fourth dimension, showing that with bicuspid valves, there's this really high velocity vortices that are created that impinge on the aortic wall and may create the, uh, you know, the mechanical substrate for uh, aortic dilatation. So when we started doing this, I'd, I'd meet with Dr. Markle, I thought these were fun images. I thought they may not have any real clinical implications, but further work in this field, uh, including a, a collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Fidak and others from uh, Calgary, uh, with more patients showed that there's some interest here. Uh, for example, if you have a, a bicuspid valve, of course, you can have fusion of one of the three commissures. The most common on the left is a right-left fusion, which directs the jet up into the, um, uh, as you see, into the uh, upper right, um, uh, component of the uh, aortic wall. Whereas if it's a uh, fusion involving the non-coronary cusp, the uh, high velocity jets hit in a different, uh, different place. When, the, when these patients then go to surgery and we have tissue from these patients, uh, the interesting finding is these hot spots where there's higher wall stress, which you can identify with MRI. Those are the regions where you have the upregulation of the uh, metalloproteinases and the TGF beta signal. So it's probably a combination of the uh, substrate there to, by genetics and uh, the, uh, the abnormalities in the um, um, uh, molecular biology of the tissue 
then uh, hit with these high velocity jets that may then turn on some of those processes as well. So this is then lead, lead, leading to that collaboration I discussed before between your institution and ours where we're actually moving forward you know, with, with grant support and others to uh, move this field forward. Um, so I hope that uh, collaboration continues. But let's get back to the uh, some of the major issues with aortic stenosis, whether it's a bicuspid valve or a trileaflet valve, the ultimate effect is something like this, which our surgeons see in the OR uh, of a patient with severely calcified valve. Um, you know, we, we've come a long way in understanding some of the um, biology of this. There is a function of aging. So over the course of a lifetime, there's a much higher risk of developing calcific aortic stenosis, whether it's a bicuspid, bicuspid valve or a, um, a trileaflet valve. Uh, and so over the age of 75 is shown in these population data by Nicomo and coworkers at the Mayo Clinic, looking at the four large um, uh, cardiovascular registries, ARIC, Cardiovascular Health Study, Cardia, and a database from most Olmstead County involving 28,000 individuals, free, free leaving people in those uh, registries um, who get an echocardiogram and one finds that uh, between four and a half and 6% of individuals over the age of 75 have calcific uh, aortic disease. Um, and so there's something here that may be uh, related to the biology of uh, uh, what people do as they age. And uh, that was shown earlier in the Framingham Heart Study, but um, since I'd like to show you some Canadian data, and I'll do that several more times today, uh, here's a, a really good study uh, updated from the Framingham data by the Canhart uh, investigators uh, in Ontario, involving 1.1 million individuals in Ontario over the age of 65, median follow-up of 13 years uh, over that period of time, uh, 21,000 developed aortic stenosis. And here are the baseline risk factors uh, associated with the subsequent development of aortic stenosis. Hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, you know, standard cardiovascular risk factors, much higher risk for developing AS. When they looked at the, the magnitude of those abnormalities, sorry, um, the, the greater the degree of hypertension or diabetes, uh, or dyslipidemia, the greater the risk. And when they had combined effects, uh, hypertension and diabetes, you know, it, the risk was magnified. And so this begins to suggest that there may be more to aortic stenosis than just the passive wear and tear of getting older, but perhaps, um, you know, maybe some inflammatory uh, disease uh, as well, proliferative lesions. And that's been shown in a number of, of studies, and I'll show this one because it's one of my favorites, regarding the uh, effect of uh, inflammation and calcification. It's a, um, a, a PET CT study from Mark Dweck's group in uh, Edinburgh, <clears throat> where they use a CT, obviously, to identify the location of the valve, but then they uh, also perform PET imaging with sodium fluoride to uh, assess uh, ossification and sodium and the fluoride deoxyglucose to measure inflammation. So here are three subjects in that study, normal, mild AS, severe AS. The patient with the more severe AS has not only greater ossification and calcification, but also a much greater degree of inflammation. Uh, this was a uh, observational cross-sectional study, but the same investigators came back three years later in 2015, uh, showing some serial changes well, here are two patients in that series, uh, also from Edinburgh, who have uh, a little bit of uh, aortic sclerosis slash moderate aortic stenosis at baseline, but the degree of uh, uh, inflammation uh, in the PET signal is way out of proportion to what is then calcified. Uh, but when they bring the patients back a couple of years later with a serial CT, they find that the areas that were inflamed and showing these uh, PET signals are the areas that became calcified. So there does appear to be an inflammatory uh, process going on that could be leading to calcification. Further information uh, in that regard also comes from uh, Canada, from the work of the group in Quebec, uh, Philippe Pibro and others, uh, by, in the study by Malmut, looking at aortic valve tissue uh, uh, resected at the time of surgery and then uh, undergoing uh, immunohistochemistry studies, uh, demonstrating an upregulation of lipoprotein-associated phospholipase A2. Uh, 
uh, LP, PLA2, uh, which is an enzyme that cleaves uh, phospholipids into fatty acids and phosphatidylcholine. Phosphatidylcholine then is an inflammatory uh, cytokine, which can lead to a further uh, inflammation. And what they find is the areas where there's upregulation of the, uh, the PLA2 on the left are areas where they're finding uh, evidence of oxidized phospholipids as well. And then further, there's uh, probably uh, important genetic substrate as well, as shown in this very large GWAS study from uh, George Slanisoulis, another Canadian colleague of yours, uh, at a time when he was uh, also uh, working with, in collaboration with the Framingham Heart Institute and collaborators around the world, which is why you know, a typical GWAS study, you've got a cast of thousands in the author list. Uh, they first uh, looked at the uh, a derivation substrate, a derivation subset of uh, 6,900 individuals of European ancestry in Framingham and Iceland, um, and uh, identified a single SNP sitting on chromosome six. Um, and this is in the locus of uh, LPA, uh, the uh, gene that codes for circulating levels of LP little a. Uh, having done this, they then validated this with 45,000 individuals of uh, multiple ethnicities from around the world, uh, demonstrating the single SNP was associated with a calcific uh, aortic valve uh, disease. And this was uh, further validated by the group in uh, Copenhagen, uh, demonstrating not only calcific disease, but also clinical aortic stenosis related to LP little a. So on the left, we have the LPA levels and the percentile um, of LP little a relative to the population. And one sees that when the um, uh, percentile of LP little a is 90% or greater uh, of the population, the, there's a significant uh, association with development of aortic stenosis, both in adjusted and, and multivariable adjusted data. Um, interestingly enough, they also had genetic information on these individuals and that same SNP that we talked about a few minutes ago, <coughs> residing on chromosome six, uh, was uh, present in about 50% of the individuals who have those higher levels of LP little a. So there is a signal there that's worth, worth noting. Um, and following through on that, uh, the Quebec group again, uh, Pivro et al, uh, Romain Capelod, uh, working with Sam Simicus, who's one of the world's leaders in uh, LP little a uh, physiology, uh, looked at an, a group of individuals who had um, mild aortic stenosis and subsetted them according to the median level of LP little a and found that the uh, uh, rate of uh, uh, progression of aortic stenosis was greater in the individuals who had the higher levels of LP little a and also the higher levels of those oxidized phospholipids that we just discussed. And so um, follow, uh, following that, I'm just borrowing a cartoon from uh, Phil uh, uh, Pibro uh, that uh, he, he, he thought of, and it probably fits the data we've discussed so far is the LP little a gets into the intracellular space. It gets hit by that uh, uh, phospholipase A2, cleaving phospholipids into oxidized fatty, fatty acids and lysophosphatidylcholine, triggering then an inflammatory response uh, and the interstitial uh, cells and the macrophages then begin to generate cytokines like BMP and kappa beta, uh, tumor necrosis factors, interleukins, and so forth, uh, turning into a, 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 a setting in which calcification begins to ensue. So that's kind of a very rapid snapshot oversimplification of a very complex process. But uh, the interesting thing with that is that, uh, you know, uh, how do we tackle LP little a? Um, uh, statins have not been found to be effective at slowing progression of aortic stenosis. And statins also um, do not uh, reduce levels of LP little a. Uh, PCSK9 inhibitors do. And so here's a study that uh, in a journal I don't usually look at, but I found this in the references of a, of a, of a, of a nice publication uh, in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, uh, looking at individuals who have a loss of function of PS, PCSK9. And so their, their levels of PCSK9 are reduced. And then when they look at the likelihood of developing aortic valve stenosis 
in these carriers versus the non-carriers, and then you adjust that for sex and age and LP little a and LDL and so forth, there is a significant reduction in the development of aortic stenosis in those individuals who have the uh, loss of function PCSK9, suggesting that a PCSK9 inhibitor like evolucumab might be able to perhaps be effective at changing natural history. We have no real data. Uh, we, we did publish a uh, post hoc analysis of the Fourier trial in patients you know, receiving uh, evolucumab versus placebo. And those individuals uh, uh, did show that um, in a, uh, a subset of the patients who developed aortic stenosis uh, or required aortic valve replacement, they had uh, higher levels of LP little a. And there was a signal that in the treatment group small numbers in the treatment group, there might be a, a reduction in the rate of these aortic valve events. Uh, a hypothesis only, but a hypothesis worth testing. So that's a, uh, you know, uh, really complicated thought process as to all the signals that could be going on here. I've been talking about the left part of this diagram from uh, Ryan Lindman, which kind of looks like the New York subway system map. Uh, on the left is lipid infiltration, which then goes into inflammation and then the fibrocalcific process. Lots of possible signals here that might be useful for drug testing. So for the uh, younger people on the call today, uh, there's lots of potential targets here for drug therapy to reduce the rate of aortic stenosis progression. So that's uh, talking about the issue of how do we prevent calcification of the valve. Equally important subject would be how do we protect the ventricle from that degree of pressure overload uh, and the, the, the subsequent hypertrophy. Um, this gets back to you know uh, one of the seminal papers in my early years from Paul Wood, seminal cardiologist in, in London, 19. 50s, early 1960s, uh, before his untimely death. Uh, this is a wonderful treatise of aortic stenosis, the 1958 Nathan's lecture, where he makes the point that aortic stenosis is a simple mechanical fault, which if severe enough imposes a heavy burden on the left ventricle, sooner or later overcomes it because one develops left ventricular hypertrophy. Compensatory mechanism designed to reduce wall stress in the setting of pressure overload. Therefore, it's a marker of the severity of the pressure overload. It's also a contributor to myocardial stiffness, uh, increased end diastolic and left atrial pressures, therefore symptoms of HEFPEF, uh, patients with normal left ventricular rejection fractions, may be a contributor to adverse outcomes. Uh, this used to be in the guidelines, uh, severe hypertrophy. Uh, we erased it from the guidelines, both in the US and Europe, because of, not because of the lack of importance, but because of lack of evidence. Uh, what degree of hypertrophy or thickness or mass would be sufficient to want to intervene in an individual who might be otherwise asymptomatic? But the issue is like most compensatory mechanisms for myocardial uh, overload, uh, LVH uh, has some benefits, but it also has some consequences. The con consequences perhaps being uh, interstitial fibrosis. Uh, that was shown early on by some seminal work by Otto Hess and Hans-Peter Krambuhl in Zurich, uh, doing biopsies in patients with aortic stenosis, demonstrating uh, lots of interstitial connective tissue. Uh, they then uh, followed this early series from the 1970s, uh, a few years later, and brought patients back after surgery. Uh, demonstrating that uh, what was there preoperatively, uh, once you have cross-linked uh, collagen, uh, may not go away following surgery. So you're left with myocardial stiffness following aortic valve replacement. This, of course, is aortic valve replacement circa 1980. Uh, the results might be different currently, but also currently we've got other ways of measuring this without biopsy, including uh, MRI shown here by uh, Dweck and coworkers, again, from Edinburgh, just uh, making the point that uh, my myocardial fibrosis could be an independent predictor of bad things, uh, even in patients who have a successful uh, aortic valve replacement. Um, a subsequent series from that group, when they had a larger number of patients, uh, they were able to subset the patients into three groups, those who had normal myocardial signals by MRI, those who had T1, T2 signal abnormalities, but without replacement fibrosis, uh, extracellular expansion, and those on the right who have actual uh, replacement fibrosis with uh, left uh, late gadolinium enhancement. Uh, they, these three groups differed in the degree of aortic stenosis, 
the more severe stenosis, having more replacement uh, fibrosis, uh, having greater left ventricular mass, more hypertrophy, uh, therefore having more diastolic abnormalities as well. And importantly, uh, also we're, we're leaking more troponin. And so, uh, and that may be why we're seeing replacement fibrosis because of uh, myocyte dropout. And so uh, these are important signals to be following, uh, perhaps uh, as we're following patients. These are all data in patients who are symptomatic, already uh, candidates for surgery. Uh, whether these would fit into our, our, our serial evaluations of asymptomatic patients is not clear, but that work is ongoing. Um, so what we've just gone over in terms of progression of valve and ventricle is summarized quite nicely in this paper from Catherine Otto, which is now uh, seven years old. Um, this is must reading for all the fellows that goes through all the things that we've gone over in the last few minutes regarding uh, uh, valve calcification, mechanisms for that, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, how to image that, uh, when to intervene. So it's must reading for the current generation. Must reading for me uh, was, uh, I was at the NIH and I was picking up uh, my mentor's mentor's work, uh, John Ross and Eugene Brownwell, uh, who in 1968 uh, wrote this uh, seminal paper on the natural history of aortic stenosis. Here's a picture of uh, Dr. Ross and Brownwell uh, uh, back in the, in the uh, uh, garden of, the, of Building 10 um, at the NIH um, uh, back then. And, um, You've all seen this paper, uh, whether you recognize it or not from this headline. Uh, this is where they make the point of the grave prognosis that appears to accompany the onset of certain symptoms. And this is where that very, very famous diagram pops up that uh, someone always shows when you talk about aortic stenosis. So here I am showing it. It's now over 50 years old. Uh, in, in 2018, we actually had a celebration for Dr. Brownwald in New York, uh, where we celebrated the 50th anniversary of this figure. And I, I kidded Dr. Brownwald by saying, you know, Dr. Brownwald, you have these uh, Timmy studies of uh, thousands of patients. Um, uh, none of those Timmy data from your, from your randomized trials will ever have the lifespan of this figure, uh, which is to the test of time. This is not based on Timmy data. This is not thousands of patients. This is based on 12 patients. Uh, but you know, that's, that's why it's a diagram without any real data. It was just based on you know, some careful observations. They pulled in some data also from uh, Paul Wood's uh, uh, observations as well to create this diagram. I'm making the point that there's this uh, a progressive uh, pressure overload myocardial hypertrophy compensation. And then when patients develop symptoms, there's a rapid fall off in survival. Uh, this was uh, 1968, dealing with a lot of uh, younger individuals in our population at the time, probably some rheumatic heart disease as well. But uh, in the current era, this curve shifts to the right with the same outcome uh, with our degenerative aortic stenosis patients. So uh, whenever someone develops symptoms, whether it's age 60 or age 80, the outcome is predictable. There's a, gonna be a bad outcome if we don't intervene. Um, and that's uh, not only um, uh, interesting that these uh, investigators back in 1968 thought of this uh, scenario, but it's been proven over and over again in real patients. And that's, that's why it stood the test of time, uh, because it's accurate. Uh, here's a, a paper from um, Bach and coworkers. It's published 40 years after that Ross and Brownwald natural history paper. Uh, showing exactly what Ross and Brownwell predicted. 50% of patients die within the next three years, exactly what Bach and coworkers demonstrated. This was in 2009. Notice this is pre-TAVR, which is why probably many of these elderly individuals were not having aortic valve replacement uh, at the University of Michigan. So at least that works. And so from a guidelines point of view, and I'm a co-conspirator in these guidelines, um, it's easy to write the guideline statement. Uh, indications for aortic valve replacement, symptomatic patients with severe AS, class one. Uh, no doubt about that. Uh, but <laughs> easier to write the guideline, more difficult for you and me to figure that out in practice. Uh, are those symptoms cardiac in origin? Uh, you know, if the... Uh, uh, population of Alberta is really like the population in the US, well, then you're dealing with the kind of patients I see. They're, they're deconditioned, they're inactive, they're overweight, uh, they're older, uh, and they're a little short of breath. Okay, now is that aortic stenosis or is that their lifestyle? 
uh, so you know, figuring that out sometimes is not always so simple. If you have a patient who has severe aortic stenosis and now is a little short of breath, that's fine. But if you have a patient with mild aortic stenosis who's a little short of breath, and three years later is moderate aortic stenosis, the patient is a little short of breath, and uh, two years after that it's severe aortic stenosis, and the patient's still short of breath. Has there been a change in cardiac symptoms? Not so easy. Um, and then we have these uh, other class one indications, um, uh, symptomatic patients with low, below low gradient aortic stenosis and reduced ejection fraction. Okay, we give those patients dobutamine to determine who may have a, a, a primary cardiomyopathy versus a low flow, low gradient uh, LV dysfunction from severe pressure overload. Uh, that's easy, again, easier to put that in a guideline statement than to figure that out in complex patients. And even more complex patients are those who are symptomatic with low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis and normal ejection fraction, maybe one third of the patients we now see. So how do we, how do we put that into uh, the nomenclature in a guideline? Uh, well, it's a typical guidelines uh, 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 statement that's not very helpful. If AS is the most likely cause of symptoms, that's great. Uh, does that tell you how to actually do that? This is really tricky. Um, you need to bring in your thinking cap. The most important thing is in these patients is to be uh, a good clinician. Clinical judgment is probably the most important thing. Does this patient look like, uh, feel like a patient with aortic stenosis where, where a uh, valve replacement is going to benefit this patient? Uh, consider the presence and severity of aortic valve calcification, really critical. So bring in a CT scan in many patients. But then also consider other non-valve conditions such as amyloidosis, uh, which I think you know is becoming kind of a, a theme now. Uh, we're seeing more patients who've got calcific aortic stenosis with or without amyloidosis. Uh, a nice series from Columbia uh, in New York, the hotbed of TAVR work. Patients referred in for TAVR with severe aortic stenosis. Uh, they did pyrophosphate scanning in a, in, in a series of these patients. And they found that the one quarter of the men uh, as you expect, more so than women, had uh, ATTR amyloidosis. Uh, uh, and the patients with amyloidosis had a greater wall thickness, greater mass, greater, uh, lower stroke volume, greater diastolic dysfunction, lower ejection fraction, more abnormal global longitudinal strain. What you'd expect with amyloidosis, but this kind of smells like aortic stenosis. You know, so separating these conditions out sometimes, it's very difficult uh, and keeping our thinking caps on for other causes of low flow, low gradient AS could be important. Anyway, so those are the three class one indications for symptomatic patients. So what do we say about asymptomatic patients? Uh, this is tricky uh, and we'll come back to this. Like how many of our asymptomatic patients are really asymptomatic? But here we do have some data, uh, good natural history studies of patients initially asymptomatic with severe aortic stenosis defined as a VMAX greater than four meters per second. Five natural history studies, starting with the uh, paper, the seminal paper from Catherine Otto in 1997 uh, at the bottom um, and followed more recently by Lancelotti and coworkers that combined um, a European Canadian multicenter registry. Uh, making the same point that in patients who are initially asymptomatic over the course of the next four to five years, the majority of patients have an endpoint. Most of the endpoints are not death. Uh, in fact, death is rare here. Most of the endpoints are patients developing an indication for aortic valve replacement. Uh, the Rosenheck data from Vienna, which was part of those five series I showed, uh, gave us further information, like the degree of calcification is an important uh, independent prognosticator which one could do uh, uh, with either echo as they did or more uh, quantitatively with CT scanning. And the Rosenheck data are important because this series of 128 patients in 2000 uh, was amplified 10 years later in 2010 with about twice as many patients where they subdivided the group with a VMAX greater than four shown here into those with a VMAX of four to five five to 5.5, greater than 5.5. And so the point being here being that if you have a VMAX greater than five meters per second, the likelihood of requiring aortic valve replacement over the course of the next three years is so high that you know, that already exceeds my comfort level. I'm, I recommend aortic valve replacement because the likelihood of requiring surgery in the short term is so high that you, you don't gain much in waiting. And you may lose something in waiting. They had some mortality in these individuals while, while waiting for um, an indication for surgery. Uh, 
these were patients uh, who all also underwent aortic valve surgery. And uh, there were an equal number of patients who died in the first 30 days after surgery. So uh, the point here is not we're going to save lives per se, but we're going to identify patients who are going to need surgery or TAVR in the near future. And again, these data predate TAVR. So the outcomes might be better if we have an early intervention with TAVR. So what is the risk of death while waiting for symptoms to trigger aortic valve replacement? And does aortic valve replacement in asymptomatic patients with severe AS improve survival? This trial was not, this study was not designed to do that. But we have other studies that are designed to look at that. And unfortunately, most of them are either uh, retrospective or prospective observational data. The uh, one on the left from Yamaguchi and co -work, Tanaguchi and co-workers in Japan is a uh, prospective registry from Japan. Uh, whereas the group on the right is a paper I contributed to here at Northwestern from John Campo, uh, Pat McCarthy, Chris Malazri, uh, a retrospective look at patients with severe aortic stenosis. Looking at those who go to early surgery versus watchful waiting with all of the caveats of the issue of uh, the confounders involved in observational state data like this. The reason I like these two papers though is the outcomes. I'm not sure you can see the, uh, the, the data on the right at five years, maybe our, our faces are covering that up. The point being though, that the outcomes were identical in these two observational series. The early AVR group had a significantly better survival than the uh, conservative group of watchful waiting um, or maybe careful surveillance instead of watchful waiting. Um, but again, these are observational data. What we need is a prospective randomized clinical trial. And luckily we now have one. For the first time, a paper from uh, uh, Korea published uh, at the uh, AHA meeting in 2019 and then in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2020 by Kong and co-workers. If you recall, this is a series where patients were randomized with severe aortic stenosis to early surgery versus conservative care. And these are the operative mortality and, and death from cardiovascular cause data where early surgery had a significant benefit compared to uh, conservative care. This was true when they looked at death from any cause. These were patients selected because they had a VMAX of 4.5 or greater, pretty severe aortic stenosis. The interesting thing here for me is, uh, uh, look at the operative mortality here. It's essentially zero for the first uh, three years. Um, now this, again, it's asymptomatic people in a good surgical center. I think we can deliver a really low mortality, but you know, can we actually deliver, promise our patients a 0% mortality over the course of the next three years with early surgery? Uh, who are the patients in this series? Uh, first of all, a small number, 145. Mean age was 64, much younger than the patients you and I see. By custard valves in 61% along with, goes along with that young age. And, but also the comorbidities were low. Only 5% had coronary disease, only 14% had diabetes. So not the kinds of higher risk patients that you and I might encounter uh, with aortic stenosis, given those risk factors that we talked about previously. And so uh, what we need are more prospective trials. So let's go back to this patient we talked about at the uh, beginning of the uh, discussion. Uh, my patient was 84 years old, uh, had severe aortic stenosis. Uh, do we do watchful waiting? Do we get more testing? Um, should we do an aortic valve replacement? Uh, none of these three options are wrong. Uh, they all might be the right thing to do, get, considering our discussions with the patient. Um, but watch waiting now has a new connotation. When I was growing up, watch for waiting meant we wait. <laughs> now the connotation is, well, if we wait four to five years, we'll have symptoms. We already showed that. And therefore he becomes a candidate for TAVR which is what he wants. He Right now, he doesn't want to have open heart surgery. And in the US, uh, he's not a candidate for TAVR because uh, there's no yet a, a regulatory approval for asymptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis. So he would rather wait. Uh, what we did do was to enroll him in a clinical trial because uh, we, and I, maybe you are also, are members of the clinical trial group doing their early TAVR trial of TAVR now versus TAVR later, where we will have a larger number of, of patients with a North American uh, risk profile compared to what we saw from Korea. Uh, now, the elephant in the room when we're talking about asymptomatic aortic stenosis are patients with AS really asymptomatic uh, you know, what, what do you and I do to try to identify who's truly asymptomatic? The, the guidelines uh, make a couple points about asymptomatic patients. Uh, let's do an exercise test. 
let's see if we can demonstrate a symptom that the patient's not uh, alluding to with careful history taking. Uh, the patient becomes symptomatic on a treadmill. Or is there a, a fall in blood pressure greater than 10 millimeters of mercury compared to the value at rest? It's a two-way indication. Uh, this sounds simple, but like everything else we've discussed, it's, it's, it's kind of messy. This is helpful, but it's not perfect in determining who is truly asymptomatic. You have to consider age and sex, comorbid conditions, overall level of, of fitness. You know, if, I, if I have my 84-year-old patient who's also deconditioned, uh, maybe overweight, he may have arthritis, when I put him on a treadmill and he has symptoms in the first minute, you know, is, is that aortic stenosis causing the symptom or is that just his lifestyle? So it's, it's difficult many times to actually fulfill these guidelines recommendations. If the ejection fraction is less than 50%, we recommend surgery but, or TAVR, but these patients are truly uh, rarely asymptomatic when you have a low ejection fraction. They're undergoing other forms of surgery. It's a class one indication also, because you wouldn't want to leave uh, significant aortic stenosis behind. And there's a couple of class two A indications. Uh, jet velocity greater than five, as we pointed out before, likelihood of needing intervention in the next three years is so high. BNP greater than three times normal for age and sex. Those data actually come from Clavel and coworkers in Quebec. Uh, peak a a a aortic valve jet velocity increasing greater than 0 0.3 meters per second per year. Uh, careful with that because of just the play in the numbers. So you need to have serial measurements here, not just two measurements. Uh, if we're talking about asymptomatic patients, we also want to be sure these patients are low surgical risk. And by that, we mean the patient is a low surgical risk and the surgical center to whom the patient is referred is a low surgical risk that we want to be able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, quote a risk of 1% or less for an asymptomatic patient, which I think you can accomplish in Calgary, and we can accomplish here at Northwestern, uh, but not maybe every center can accomplish that. So it's, it's, it's a low surgical risk from both the patient and the surgical center perspective. So what are our knowledge gaps? Uh, the symptomatic patient, that are these cardiac symptoms? The asymptomatic patient, are they truly asymptomatic? What are the mechanisms of inflammation and calcification? Are, is there a role of biomarkers, BNP, uh, other, other uh, markers, troponin, markers of fibrosis, et cetera? Uh, valve area gradient, gradient and flow in the area in the patients with low flow, low gradient AS. Ventricular vascular coupling, where you've got uh, abnormalities in the peripheral vasculature, which for, further increase the impedance to ejection. Evolution of TAVR to low risk patients. So let's just get to that issue for a few minutes too. Uh, SAVR versus TAVR. Uh, we've obviously come a huge, a long way in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, these are data from the STS registry demonstrating what's happened in North America. As you know, uh, in 2017, uh, TAVR eclipsed surgical aortic valve replacement in the STS database, as shown by D'Agostino in 2019. Um, Interesting for me is though TAVRs had this meteoric rise, there was very little reduction in overall surgical volume because during this period of time, up to 2017, uh, the low risk patients were still being referred for surgery, meaning that TAVR was taking on these patients who never were being sent for surgeons, surgery. Surgeons were not seeing these higher risk individuals. So a very little dip in surgical volume but of course, 2017 was when the two uh, low risk trials got published. So that's gonna change things as we've gone from prohibitive risk to high risk, intermediate risk and low risk surgery. Now we're gonna see a huge change in the number of patients being referred for TAVR. And of course we have that asymptomatic trial underway as well. So keep your seatbelts on for that one. But if we're talking about the, comp the comparison of surgery versus um, uh, surgical AVR versus transcatheter AVR, we could focus on these uh, three series of, of trials. Realizing that in the high-risk trials, mortality was the endpoint. You had hard endpoints. When we move to the lower-risk individuals, we start developing composite endpoints because more mortality is not that big an issue in the lower risk patients. In fact, in the low surgical risk patients, it's mortality, stroke, and cardiovascular hospitalization. So the, the endpoints become a little messy here and teasing out you know, what is the real impact of TAVR versus surgery. Um, and so if we look at 30-day outcomes, uh, I think you could summarize it 
pretty simply that uh, the risk of atrial fibrillation and bleeding is lower with TAVR. Uh, the risk of vascular injury in pacemakers is lower with surgical ABR. From a mortality and stroke point of view, it's relatively equivalent. So you could argue that TAVR would be you know, equivalent or not inferior to surgery. But longer term follow-up data are also important. And there's this very nice meta-analysis by Siontis and coworkers in um, European Heart Journal 2019, looking at seven trials, Partner, the Corval trials, and Notion, uh, putting those the data together in a meta-analysis showing that factors favoring TAVI would be all-cause mortality, which was significantly uh, reduced with TAVI over the course of a two-year outcome, uh, especially with femoral access. And other factors also favoring TAVI were stroke, slightly but significantly lower, acute kidney injury, new onset atrial fibrillation, as you'd expect. Uh, major bleeding also, as you might expect uh, in the uh, two-year follow-up of uh, TAVR versus SAVR. Neutral would be cardiovascular death, disabling stroke, myocardial infarction, or endocarditis. And the factors that favor SAVR were vascular complications, significantly uh, lower with SAVR, and pacemakers, significantly lower with SAVR, especially uh, an issue, with, as you know, with self-expanding uh, uh, transcatheter valves as well, were a really highly significant difference uh, in outcome uh, regarding pacemakers. So uh, what are the missing pieces in uh, the low-risk TAVR data as we move to more low-risk patients? Uh, durability, key issue. We're still looking for good long-term durability data. Uh, the issue of subclinical leaflet thrombosis that leads to, in some patients, valve uh, stiffness and thickening, maybe long-term structural valve deterioration. Uh, we don't know that yet. And then these uh, subgroups of patients who thus far are a little bit uh, troubling for a transcatheter approach, although the bicuspid valve patients are um, uh, getting more and more data, but patients with more extensive CAD, aortic aneurysms associated with MR or TR uh, still remain for the most part in the domain of, the, uh, of our surgical colleagues. Younger patients, um, Durability becomes an issue. Pacemaker rates become an issue. Under the age of 65, I'm still nervous about recommending TAVR, although we do that in patients who have uh, lots of other issues going on that increase the risk of surgery. But in, in, for the most part, the individuals get less than age 65 are candidates for surgical uh, AVR because of the durability issue and the issue of pacemakers. Uh, asymptomatic patients, really important. And then finally, uh, how do we measure quality? Uh, we have an issue in the U.S. I think you've got it better under control in Canada, but in the U.S. we've got an expanding number of centers. Uh, we want to have more access for our patients, and every center wants to be in the game, so they're not losing their patients to the center next door. And so uh, what's the relationship between volume and outcomes? Using volume as a very poor surrogate for quality. Um, here are data from uh, Vema Guli and coworkers from the TBT registry, just looking at annualized hospital procedural volume on the left versus the hospital number. And you see a, a large number of low volume centers shifted to the right of that uh, uh, left-sided panel. Whereas the right-sided panel then uh, looks at the 30 day mortality as a function of hospital volume. So there's a, clearly a learning curve um, and so do we want to create more centers or do we want to refer our patients to centers of excellence? And how do we define that? Because volume is not enough, but at least there is a signal here that low volume centers, at least until they get up to speed, uh, do not provide the same kind of quality we would like in terms of hard outcomes. Clinical challenges in 2021. Threshold for TAVR is declining in clinical trials registry and in your and my clinical practice. Multidisciplinary heart team is really essential. Let's bring everybody together, identify the patients. Uh, we still do that with our surgeons, our cardiologists, our nurses. Uh, the uh, cardiologists are both the interventionalists and the imaging cardiologists, people like myself who refer patients into the system. Um, shared decision-making with the patients is critical in the decision. This becomes tricky because when you bring in the patients into the decision, which is really the most important thing we can do, you know they're all going to want TAVR. And that creates some issues for us uh, because when do you withhold TAVR? Uh, a patient who's 40 years old and needs an aortic valve replacement uh, wants a transcatheter approach. Uh, probably not. He's too low risk for surgery and we don't know these issues of durability and pacemakers. Patient who is 98 years old 
multiple comorbidities and frailty uh, who may not benefit from replacing the valve because of the comorbidities. That's futile. The saying no becomes really very, very important. So this becomes quite challenging for us now. Uh, not so much when we do it, but when we should not do it and discussing that with our patients. So I'll just harken back to this uh, paper we discussed a few minutes ago from Paul Wood. Uh, simple mechanical fault, which sooner or later overcomes it. Well, that's easy to state, but for you and me, it's no longer so simple. You know, who's got aortic stenosis with this low flow, low gradient business? And uh, when are we gonna recommend a transcatheter approach versus a surgical approach? All the nuances that go into our decision-making really is co quite complex. And if you, you'll uh, allow me one final slide, um, uh, this is something I discuss with my fellows all the time. And my fellows are tired of seeing this figure. You know, it's capturing sound waves using Linux version versus uh, Harvey Weigenbaum's version on the right with an echo transducer, uh, both capturing sound waves. Uh, the issue here being that my fellows are very good on the right and probably better than I am on the right, you know, and all the new things that echo can do, uh, longitudinal strain and so all those really interesting uh, technical advances with imaging. I'm better on the left, uh, not because I've got better ears, because I've been, do been doing it longer. So the left represents clinical judgment. And so this combination of clinical judgment versus technical advances uh, is really challenging because we do a good job of teaching the technology to the next generation. Uh, we're not doing a very good job of teaching clinical gestalt and uh, physical exam and so forth and, and interacting with our patients. And the reason this is so complicated is because now there's a third hand in the, in the pie here uh, holding a tabber valve. And so how do we bring this all together to determine the, the clinical um, indications, uh, what we know, what we don't know, and do our patients also know what we don't know when we're having those conversations with our patients? So uh, it's, it's a challenging area, but it's, it's actually quite interesting and it keeps evolving, which is what's kept me interested in this field for so long. And I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to be with you and uh, share these thoughts with you. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. That was a fantastic uh, review. Uh, I got one of these. You should get one of these. So that way you got, you know, <laughs> both worlds. There you go. <laughs> and, yeah. and everything is in your, in your iPhone. It tells you what's going on. Absolutely. Even Absolutely. with the guideline recommendation. So, you know. Well, we got to put that in the, in the hands of the right people who know how to use exactly. it. Exactly. That's the problem. So uh, that's a, a great uh, overview. Let me ask you, uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat and, the, and let me ask you something. So you did uh, pose the, uh, the role of inflammation and the role of LP little a. And so two things, are we in the future going to target these as part of therapy, like a poly pill that has like, you know, canakinumab and uh, PCSK9? Yeah, but still there's a residual risk. What is the cause of the residual risk? Yeah, well, you know, our, our bodies are interesting. When you start blocking one mechanism, there's usually an uh, end run and other me mechanisms make it upregulated. And, uh, you know, LPA little a is a nice hypothesis. It's, it's yet to be tested. And of course, we're still waiting for the drugs to reduce LP little a, although PCS, PCS canine inhibitors may be, uh, may be effective. Uh, they're not targeted for that. And there are other drugs in the pipeline, as you know, that are directly targeting LP little a. We have to wait you know, for the clinical trials. Now we have no, no data at all yet, really, with aortic stenosis, other than the observation that LP little a may be a player. Um, but there's so many other players that, uh, that, that may just be you know, one piece of the puzzle with a lot of other pieces. So I, I don't think we're taking business away in the near future from our interventional cardiologists and our surgical teams. And hopefully the interventional cardiologists, surgical team, surgical team are one team. So we're making those decisions together. But um, I, it's, a great, it's a great thought. And I suspect in the next uh, 20 years, uh, Carlos, there probably will be some drugs that can slow down progression. Um, either, either slow down progression of the valve or protect the ventricle. You know, uh, we, have, we have really good drugs right now that may be cardioprotective to the ventricle uh, in the setting of severe pressure overload. We don't know that yet, but, you know, uh, Sucubitrol Valsartan, SGLT2 inhibitors, you know, they, they have interesting effects. Um, that hypertrophy, again, is important to protect the ventricle from the pressure overload, but that does have deleterious effects. So um, another uh, area where clinical trials would be really important. 
Thanks. So we've got a, a question from Dr. Raji in uh, Edmonton. So he's asking, uh, sodium fluoride is not technically a marker of inflammation, but of active hydroxyapatite deposition. Would a drug that delays hydroxyapatite deposition be a desirable, desirable to slow progression of uh, aortic stenosis? Great, great, great thought. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully I made that point that sodium fluoride is a marker of ossification slash calcification and, and, not, and not, not inflammation where the sodium, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the fluorodeoxyglucose, F18, FDG, is a marker of, of inflammation, although that's also debatable whether it's uh, inflammation or ischemia or other things. Um, but um, yeah, so th another, another target might be uh, drugs that are, are blocking those mechanisms further downstream from the inflammatory signals and the lipid infiltration. That's why I was showing that uh, subway uh, map of New York, where there's so many other targets there, either upstream or downstream, that might be uh, druggable uh, to reduce the progression of aortic stenosis or maybe even prevent it. You know, if you have a patient with a bicuspid valve at age 20, uh, that's a great patient for a clinical trial because you know over the course of time there's gonna be uh, problems. Uh, the issue there is no one's gonna do a clinical trial that lasts 30 years. And so we, we need to have maybe other markers like the degree of calcification and serial uh, markers of calcification. So that's a great question. And I think that would be a, a possible target for therapy. There's another question that in patients with a, a symptomatic severe aortic stenosis, is there a recommended timing of valve intervention and whether this patient should be worked up uh, for intervention as an inpatient versus an outpatient. Yeah, great, great point. So uh, I, I think it's all your clinical judgment and, and how severe are you know, the symptoms, how severe is the uh, stenosis. So, you know, if I had a patient with a, a, a VMAX of four, a mean gradient of, uh, you know, 45 millimeters of mercury, new onset of shortness of breath, okay, that, that's an outpatient workup. Whereas a patient coming in with you know, really severe aortic stenosis and the patient is uh, almost in pulmonary edema, yeah, that's that's a rapid workup and a rapid pass through to uh, you know identify you know the risks of that patient and get that patient uh, into the hands of a surgeon or interventional cardiologist. So and then in between we've got all the real patients you know where where sometimes it would be important to do a rapid workup and not play around with this. Uh, there are some studies I'm sure you've seen them of, of mortality rates waiting for surgery. Um, in fact, in the Catherine Otto study, the, 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 that 1980, what study, 87 study, uh, the patients who died, uh, half of them were ready to have surgery, but they uh, didn't get surgery in time. And so um, it, there is a risk there. And I think uh, whether we can identify all the patients at risk is something else. I, I, I think, uh, again, clinical judgment becomes important, but some patients probably do need a rapid uh, workup, inpatient or outpatient. So a final question here is in your experience, how useful do you find the calcium scoring of the aortic valve in patients with paradoxical low flow, uh, low gradient aortic stenosis, especially when the score is close to the cutoff value for men and women? Yeah, so um, again, easy to make those statements that the aortic valve calcification is helpful. Uh, you can quantify it, but uh, I'm always struck by the data I've seen. Again, I got the seminal paper from Maria Neck Clavel in Quebec, um, working with the group of Mayo Clinic. There's scatter in those data, you know. Uh, so the, the mean values are greater than normal, uh, greater than men than women, but there's a lot of scatter. And so you, you, know, you can draw thresholds above which it's, it's really abnormal, but there's a lot of patients below that threshold. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it, it is helpful though, if the valve's not calcified, for example, that's, that's, a, that's very helpful in, in our uh, uh, you know, middle-aged older people because uh, that's probably not aortic stenosis, that's something else. Um, but when it, when it is calcified, uh, okay, is that true aortic stenosis or is that a little bit of aortic sclerosis uh, superimposed upon a patient with uh, you know, uh, something like amyloid or some other restrictive cardiomyopathy? Uh, not always so clear. Um, it's another thing to kind of throw into your bonnet. Another thing quite helpful is longitudinal strain. Uh, also very helpful um, to uh, more and more emerging data that um, it goes in parallel with everything else as the aortic valve gets um, more calcified and the ventricle becomes more hypertrophied. 
other things we're already measuring, uh, but longitudinal strain moves in that direction too. And so in these problematic patients, uh, GLS could be helpful. Uh, realizing that GLS is also abnormal when you have cardiomyopathy. So it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, an end all. Uh, we have to bring in everything we can uh, to try to identify who these patients are because it is a growing number. Um, maybe, you know, I think maybe 30% or more of the patients we see now don't fit these classical definitions of severe aortic stenosis. And uh, trying to determine who, who's who is really hard. Well, thanks, Bob. That was a fascinating and very useful lecture. I hope to see you sometime soon and do take care. Thank you very much, Carlos. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Thanks okay, again. We'll see you around. Bye now.